Well, um, good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming. My name's Amy, and I'm the project manager for a project called The Hold, which is for Suffolk Record Office. And just as a quick show of hands, anyone actually been to Suffolk Record Office? There's one person. Uh, does anyone know what the record office is? Or think they know what the record office is? No, even the person who's been to it doesn't put their hand up for that one. <laughs> so, um, what we're doing um, today is you will learn what Suffolk Record Office is and why you should all visit it, but it's part of this bigger project to develop the hold. And um, the hold, there's a model of it at the back. Um, it hasn't been built yet. We're just working on uh, developing uh, the project, but it's going to be a new home for all the archives for the county. It's going to have exhibition space, a shop, a cafe, education rooms, and it's really going to allow the record office to um, get people involved in the archives and actually understand what archives are and why they're important, because I'm sure you've all been dragged to a museum at some point in your childhood. Um, but probably not record office, but we've got just as much history, just as much heritage in the records as a museum's got in terms of artefacts, and that's what the whole project is all about. So where is it going to be? Well, do you know where the University of Suffolk building is in Ipswich, down by the waterfront? So just opposite there, um, the, that's the university building, and we're right opposite um, the road, and um, our new building will occupy about half of that car park site. Um, then, really, why is it needed? Well, none of you have been, so you won't know. Well, apart from the, um, the, the girl who has been. It's currently in this old Victorian building. Um, it's really out of the way, um, which is probably why a lot of you have never been. But within this building, we look after nine miles of historic archives that go back to the 12th century. Um, and within those archives, we estimate there's something like 90 million different pages of original records that are there for free for you to come and look at, um, including some really beautiful, interesting material. Um, some of the other reasons we need to do this project, um, we're absolutely full. So all our archive boxes and all the space we've got for storage is completely run out, which means we end up having to do things like stop collecting, which is not something we want to do. Um, there's a genuine photograph of our Ipswich branch up there in the right with the leaky roof. The accommodation's not great. It's, it's, it's old, it's falling apart, essentially. And then the other interesting reason we're doing it is if you look at the age graph there, this is what our existing customer base looks like and you can see the big red line on the right hand side showing that the only people that visit us at the moment are largely slightly older 65 years of age and over which is not good news in terms of the future of the record office we want younger people to come and visit us and start using us so what the HOLD project will do, it will allow us to start doing things like exhibitions so we can actually get some of the treasures out of the collections and, and show them um, to everyone. But also activities, getting people involved in activities um, like today's talk, for example. Um, you know, getting um, younger people looking at the material. There's an example there of a play that some um, youth theatre did based on some original records about a murder. Um, we've got oral history. Um, there's actually some students from Northgate who came to visit us and did a little bit of research into their family history with, with Bridget, our collections manager, and really just bring the records alive um, for a much bigger range of people. But why would you want to? And some of the um, talk today will hopefully give you a taster of, of, of why archives are important and, um, and why you should come and look at them when the hold is ready. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mandy Rawlins, who's going to do the talk. Um, she's a recent graduate from the University of Suffolk, having um, a achieved a first in history, and she'll hate me for saying that, but she did. She's brilliant. Um, and she also volunteers regularly for the Suffolk Record Office. Good morning, everybody. Thanks very much for coming. Um, as um, Amy said, I'm a history graduate, um, and I actually spent quite a lot of time in the Suffolk Records Office. 
Um, so I'm here today really to sing its praises, but also talk a little bit about truth and finding truth and finding truth in our history, but also in our contemporary society. And one of the main phenomena that's hitting us at the moment is fake news. Um, earlier this month, Collins Dictionary announced fake news as its word of the year. And it's defined as false, often sensationalized um, information disseminated under the guise of news reporting. Okay, so basically it's stories that are put out which are emotive and they drive people for action. And that action is for political or financial gain by its authors. Um, and the idea is that people will take action. So I, I thought about this and thought, well, if I think about history, do I think about propaganda in the past? And is propaganda any different to fake news? Propaganda was used primarily by state authorities, sort of uh, First and Second World War. And yes, although they weren't telling the truth to the citizens, it was controlled quite a lot through very limited news agencies. And also, communications was very slow then, so there was a, a lot tighter control on that news. But things are very different now. And the main reason why it's different now is the social media revolution. And I'm sure you all know more, much more about it than I do. Okay, so why is history like fake news? Well, um, Lucy, I do like Lucy. She's not the most famous academic historian, but she says it as I think she, it is. The story of our past is often to, down to interpretation, and much of British history is heavily edited and even a deceitful version of events. History is not a record of what happened in the past, but more like a tapestry of different stories woven together by whoever was in power at the time. So is history like fake news? Um, history is a construct. It's society's way of telling stories of the past. So you have labels, you have Victorians, you have Tudors, you have the world wars. Um, and news very much is like a construct as well because of all the news stories in the world, news agencies can't report on all of them. They have to choose, and that's like history. You choose, they've, people have chosen what they're gonna write stories about. The same with, um, with fake news is there's always a, a news report has multiple voices. You have multiple witnesses to events, and that's the same with history. Um, lots of people, different, different people write about the same event and have a completely different interpretation. And with fake news, like history, you always have to sort of analyze why something has been written. What is the reason that they've written um, a particular type of history, as you would with fake news. There's always a reason, a motivation behind, and sometimes that can tell more about what's happened than the, um, the factual fake news itself. Okay, so who actually writes history? Well, everybody can write history. Um, the press can write history, uh, politicians have written history, all of us have written history. But today I want to talk to you about academic historians purely because a lot of you are history students and this is what we have to sort of study. Um, academic historians seek the truth. They seek the truth through empirical evidence. They look at sources. Now sometimes it's often complicated by the fact of interpretation. They have biases maybe. They may have a motivation for writing something. And also a historian writing a story may be affected by the culture around them at that time. And that could be different. So if you, a historian writing something in the 1960s may have a very different interpretation of a current or contemporary historian. So to understand how um, history is written and the fact that historians base their history, their writings on primary sources, you need to also look at the relationship with the archivist. The archivist is the protector of our primary sources. Um, they are the people who decide what gets um, stored, what gets protected, and then they're also the people who decide that what doesn't get protected. So basically what they will do, they will legitimize, they will legitimize and sanctify certain documents, but they'll also be negating others and destroying them. So it's quite a responsibility. They also provide access to these documents, but also they're protecting them. So sometimes you may not have access to certain documents. That may be the physical protection, that something's just too delicate to be looked at, but it also might have more um, social implications. So maybe health records um, that you can't have access to till so many years of it have passed. They fulfill a legal, administrative, and cultural requirement for documenting organizations and individuals' papers. 
Um, and so there's a vast selection of, of stuff which I will talk about later. But they also have a role for doc democ sorry, excuse me, democratizing archives. It sounds a bit, a bit, bit um, wide ranging, but basically if you have archives available to everybody and everybody has access to the, those, then they have the ability to um, do something with them. So there's an element of social justice as well. So they're quite important people, archivists. So, if fake news is undermining society's trust in news reporting, then we have an obligation as historians to seek the truth of the past using empirical, empirical, empirical evidence, primary sources. And who looks after them? That's the archivists. So what we need to do is when we look at them, we need to interrogate them, investigate them, interpret, compare, and draw conclusions to, to, the, to find our best truth of those documents. So why is that important to you? As students, history students, I think, political students, uh, politics students, sorry, um, and we might even have some media studies. Um, how does this actually impact you? Well, it will develop your historical analysis skills. You will be able to scrutinize these documents and interpret them to seek your own truth in the events of the past. You can look at them and question who, what, why, where, when. Who wrote them? Why were they written? What are they? When were they written? And those sort of questions can actually make you consider the wider impact of what you're being told. It's also important to acknowledge the interpretation of other historians. A historians' views as you analyze them against a source will shift over time. So like I said earlier, somebody in the 1920s, 30s may have a different view of somebody in the 60s, from the 90s and even today. So you have to acknowledge how um, historians' views have changed. And you must be confident in your own research. That's one of the most important things. If you're seeking the truth, believe in what you are assessing yourself when you read these documents. And this, these analysis skills are only going to enhance your own essays, your exams, and possibly dissertations in the future. So basically, whether you're skimming through a historical newspaper archive or browsing through your Facebook feed. Please don't believe everything you read. So what does the Suffolk Records Office have to offer you as a historian? As I said, it's a local, um, a place for depositing local official documents. You'll have county records, etc. cetera. Um, but also they have a vast local newspaper archive. They also have personal and business archives for, throughout, from businesses and individuals from out, throughout Suffolk. They have photographs, films, and oral histories, which is a growing area. They also have a vast selection of secondary sources of um, locally sourced books and um, manuscripts. And also, when you go down to the records office, you also have access to Ancestry and Find My Past. And people are really nice down there, and they can help you with, if you're looking for something, they can help you find it. What we tried to do today is really show you some of the, the um, items that are in the records office actually might have some relevance to the courses that you're taking. The records office have a vast selection of uh, primary documents related to the First World War, too big for me to um, sort of assess and try and go through with you. But if you check out the Suffolk uh, Archives website, you can actually link through and there's a full list of all the documents available. Um, also, uh, Berry Records Office has a full selection of Suffolk uh, regiment um, records as well. So today, I'm going to just quickly, briefly talk to you about a really interesting um, incident that happened in Suffolk in 1917, and this relates to the war in the air. Um, basically, it's about a Zeppelin being shot down in Theberton, um, which is just outside Leyston, on the 17th of June 1917. Um, Zeppelins was a new phenomenon um, because the First World War brought the war to home. It was a, it was a new total war. Um, and actually seeing these huge cigars flying in the sky and bombing your, your home must have been really quite frightening. I mean, it, to me, it'd be like looking at aliens coming. It's very, very, very strange. So basically, I'll tell you the story and then afterwards I'll sort of talk about why, why we think this is important to, um, to the studies of the war in the air in particular, nationally even. So basically, um, on the 16th of, um, of June, two new Zeppelins left Northolt in Germany. 
These were called high climbers. They were a new breed, a new brand of Zeppelin that could fly so much higher than before, between 16 and 20,000 uh, feet in altitude. And they were given orders to go to London and bomb. So they set out, and I'll be honest, I've read some of the accounts of the, um, the crew on board, and it's horrific. It's freezing up there, they're wearing fur coats, they have lack of oxygen, they can hardly breathe. And what happens is, the engine starts to malfunction because it just can't cope in those um, circumstances. So the first Zeppelin heads off to London but actually ends up bombing Ramsgate in Kent and killing three people. And our second uh, Zeppelin is L48. And he realises, or the captain realises, that they're having difficulty with the engine and they're not going to make it to London. So they decide that the best thing to do is head for Harwich and give Harwich its, its payload. So they appear over Suffolk, they head over Orford, they drop a few bombs at Martlesham, still thinking that heading for Harwich, they manage to drop a few more at Falkenham and Kirkham, which is sort of between Felixstowe and the Deben. Um, and at this point, um, they realise that they're just going to have to go home. So they receive um, news from Germany that there's a headwind, or tailwind, sorry, at 11,000 feet, and they need to reduce their altitude. So that's what they decide to do. But unfortunately, their compass is frozen, so they think they're heading back to Germany. In fact, what they're actually doing is heading right up the Suffolk coast. At this time, London um, can actually um, know, they, they, can inter they can intercept, sorry, the radio signals to the Germans, so they know exactly where the Zeppelins are. So they decide to send up some airplanes to intercept. So it brings us to a local story um, at Orford Ness. Now, do you know where Orford Ness is on the, on the coast, just below Albra, north of, um, sort of the Woodbridge area? They developed um, an armaments an and um, experimental flight centre. It was new, planes were new, and at this particular place, um, it was Saturday night, and most of the crew were at Nipswich having a, a night off. And there was a few, a few pilots still there. So the first pilot that went up was um, Captain Sornby in his, um, his DH-2 de Havilland, which is, um, if you're a nerdy about planes, it's a, a de Havilland plane that was developed. And he was also followed by um, Lute Second Lieutenant Holden and um, Sergeant Ashby in a Farnham Experimental 2B, which is a two-seater plane with a propeller behind them so they can both have um, machine guns. Um, and also they were joined by, um, by a Canadian, uh, Cap Lieutenant Watkins, and he flew out from Essex to join them. Um, Cap uh, Lute Second Lieutenant um, Holder reported later it took him half an hour just to reach the altitude to meet the Zeppelin. That sort of tells you the sort of difference in technology maybe when we, when we look at these. And basically all three planes um, attacked the Zeppelin and there's a lovely painting there, you can see it's been attacked. Um, Zeppelin came down, crashed in a field, in a farm, just outside Theberton. 19 crew, um, only three survived, and basically they were burnt alive. And as, as the pilots were, f were shooting on them and saw the Zeppelin come down, they all reported their horror of the fate of their, their German counterparts. And Lieutenant Hold himself flew over and saw one of the Germans scramble out of the Zeppelin crash and gave him a nod just to acknowledge it's great that you've made it out alive. So I think that's quite telling. Um, I've got um, Harry just to come up and he's going to talk a little bit more, and Becky, um, about what actually happened afterwards. Uh, so eyewitness reports from Ipswich suggest that there were taunts and cheering as the German Zeppelin crashed. In Southwold, Thomas Denny stated that he rushed into the road and, the treme and a tremendous cheer went up, ringing through the countryside. I will never forget it. 30,000 people then visited the crash site the next day, which was a huge feat considering not many people owned cars and petrol was rationed. Those who had heard the dogfight in the night and saw the glowing red fireball in the sky rushed to the scene on bicycle or horseback to get a glimpse of the crash site. Archives suggest that grave diggers from the Baton Church refused to bury the 14 Germans killed. Vickers often received anonymous letters shaming them if they were buried any Germans. However, women from Garrett Engineering Works in Leyston volunteered to dig the graves. Reports of the funeral suggest a sombre affair with possession of the coffins through the village. Bystanders showed respect for the dead. One onlooker laid a wreath with a message. 
from an Englishman who understands that each of these souls is somebody's son. One of the survivors was sent to Ranley Road School, Ipswich, that was being used as a hospital. Initial concerns of Howes and the Zeppelin crew, who were described by the press as killers of women and children, were soon dispelled. His general behaviour endeared him to all he came in contact with and bid him farewell when he was transferred to a prisoner of war camp. What this shows us is um, the Zeppelin was actually shot down by planes developed at Orford Ness. Um, and the, one of the actual plane, the Farnham Experimental, was actually built by, um, there we go, Ransom, Sims and Jeffries in Ipswich. And there's some pictures here showing you the women um, constructing the planes. And it's, it, what it brings, sort of the, the technology side, was happening here in Suffolk. The planes were being built here, they were being tested. At Orford Ness, they were also testing other technologies, um, suits that would keep you warm when flying at, at heights. Um, they also developed um, lighting for instruments so that the planes could fly at night. So it was, it was all sort of happening here in this area, which I think is just really interesting. Um, I think everybody expects that they're gonna be, there's going to be an anti-German sentiment, and we've, we've seen that in some of the examples of people from Ipswich can see this happening 24 miles away. It's like down with the Huns. But actually, how those Germans were treated after they died, the, the, the ceremony of their burial, um, and it, things like that, the way they were treated in the hospital, actually, once they came in contact with, with British people, they were, the British were much more empathic towards them. Um, the final report of the war, um, which, which I got out of the local archives, said that in East Suffolk alone, there were 39 raids during the war, 28 Zeppelins, nine airplanes, and two naval attacks of which 42 people were killed and 90 were injured. So it was all happening here, and that's just East Suffolk alone. So in conclusion, really, what I'm trying to say is there's all these local archives that can make the history that you study come alive. Local archives can lead you on a research journey, which makes your wider topic come alive in your own locality. Your local archive is a great starting place. It's got such a wealth of primary sources that can lead you further in other areas of research. And you can build your own interpretations, and you can compare that with other historians, and it will give you a wider understanding that can only help with your exams and your essays. Okay? Um, that's sort of the end, really, for the moment. Just a quick reminder before you leave. Um, would you pick up, you're more than welcome to pick up a sheet. There's an information sheet with a lot of the um, websites and availability of uh, sources. And also, there's an evaluation form. Okay, well, thanks very much for coming. Um, please go onto Suffolk Archives website um, and just remember that there's so much treasure there um, that will always be of interest in any sort of studies you might have, whether they be politics, media studies, or whatever. Okay, thank you. And like I said, thank you. Thank you. We just wanted to end really by saying thank you to Northgate High School for letting us um, deliver this talk today um, and also to acknowledge the support from the Heritage Lottery Fund um, without whom these kinds of activities wouldn't be uh, possible for, for the whole project um, and also just a quick chat about what our key learning points were from, um, from this morning and I think what was really interesting was when we asked the students um, to put their hand up to say have you been to the record office only one student put their hand up and then when we asked them do they understand what a record office is none of them put their hand up including the one that had been there mm. so that really does um, underline why we're doing this project I think um, Mandy I don't know what your key sort of thoughts are having delivered the talk now yeah I think it's interesting that um, the that they hadn't used the records office before and to me that just highlights why we're doing this and why the hold is so necessary mm -hmm. that uh, the younger generation need to engage with the uh, local archives because it's just going to enrich their own studies um yeah i thought it went really really well actually mm. it did and i think your talk was you know really well delivered and really well really well received and hopefully it's got them them thinking i mean harry you you were saying you'd never been to the record office before exactly, uni yeah. either. I've gone all through sick form and school studying history and I didn't even know what it was until I came to uni. Um, so obviously if I didn't know what it was I was never going to go. So that just shows how important presentations like this are to sick form students to raise awareness of it. Good stuff. Right. Well again thank you Northgate and thank you to the Heritage Lottery Fund.